Operator theory is one of the foundations of quantum mechanics, and it's one of those mathematical areas that stores the craziest things that can possibly happen in what we call reality. And the theorem we'll talk about today is a way of shedding light into the dark universe of Hilbert spaces. This is the most powerful theorem in operator theory, called the spectral theorem. To appreciate its importance, it helps if we first understand why it's called that. Imagine shining light through a prism. What happens? The prism splits the light into its spectrum of colors, each with its own wavelength. Even though the white light looks uniform, it's actually made up of many different components, each contributing in its own way. The spectral theorem does the same for some operators, especially in Hilbert spaces. A complicated operator, like a sort of white light transformation, might seem abstract at first, but the spectral theorem decomposes it into simpler parts, each associated with a frequency, or with a wavelength, so the eigenvalue, acting along a specific color direction, so the eigenspace or spectral subspace. In a nutshell, the theorem says that a normal operator acts by stretching space along special directions given by the eigenvectors, and we can reconstruct the whole operator by combining these actions, either by summing in finite dimensions or integrating in infinite dimensions over all those directions. Operator theory is a branch of functional analysis. One of the most famous books on functional analysis out there is Functional Analysis by Walter Rudin. Let's go to page 308, where we find a particular case of the spectral theorem for a single bounded normal operator. Try to read it and see if you can understand it. In order to understand this theorem, as you see it here in the book, you'd have to know a bunch of things already. In this video, however, we'll study the theorem from the intuitive point of view, so you don't really need to know all of those things to get the gist of it. But if you want more details, you can check the PDF link in the description. And even though intuition is not enough to learn a subject, after seeing this explanation, I believe that rereading the theorem and studying the subsequent explanations in the book itself, which you can find, by the way, in the description, will seem much easier. Okay, so let's jump into this explanation. First of all, let's take a few steps back to understand the context from which this theorem comes from. And also so that we can understand its intent, the motivation behind it. Imagine a simple 2 by 2 matrix in linear algebra. At first glance, it's just a small table with four numbers. But actually, it's more than that. It represents a linear transformation in 2D space. Again, check out the PDF link for more details. A transformation can act on a vector rotating it, stretching it, or reflecting it, for example. This is the core idea of linear algebra, studying linear transformations of finite dimensional spaces using matrices. Of course, linear algebra is actually more than that, but in its essence, that is its goal. Now imagine a 3x3 three three matrix. It is the same idea, but in three dimensions. We can go even further to n by n matrices acting on Rn or Cn, real or complex spaces. And we can study how these matrices transform higher dimensional vectors. One powerful tool is diagonalization which means rewriting a matrix in simpler form using its eigenvalues and eigenvectors. These eigenvectors point in directions that are unchanged by the transformation, except for scaling, and the eigenvalues tell us the amount of scaling. But what if we want to extend this idea beyond finite dimensions? What if we want to study transformations not only on Rn, but on infinite dimensional spaces? And that's where functional analysis comes in. But Sophia will be the one to tell you guys about it. To understand the shift, think of a vector as a discrete list of numbers, like a box with n values. A function, on the other hand, is like an infinite list of numbers, one for each point on a continuous interval. In this sense, functions generalize vectors. They store data continuously rather than discreetly. In linear algebra, a matrix can act on a vector via a sum. In functional analysis, an operator can act on a function via an integral instead of a sum, because now we're summing up a continuous set of numbers. This is called an integral operator, so you can think of some operators as infinite-dimensional matrices, where sums become integrals. 
Now pay attention, because this what I'm about to tell you is the key to understanding this theorem. Just like we try to diagonalize matrices to simplify them, we want to decompose operators on infinite dimensional spaces in a similar way. But now, eigenvalues might form a continuous spectrum, and eigenvectors might not exist in the usual sense. And that's exactly why students find functional analysis, and as a consequence, operator theory, so confusing. It's really difficult to grasp the idea of transferring from discrete to continuous spectra. Plus, it's really challenging to visualize the continuous analog of projections onto eigenspaces. Trust us when we say we had a really hard time when making this video trying to come up with visual representations of what happens in spectral decompositions of an operator in infinite dimensions. We're still not completely satisfied, to be honest, but let us know what you guys think. So here we go. Instead of a finite sum of a projections onto eigenspaces, we need a continuous decomposition. And that's exactly why we call it a spectral measure. Okay, so let me explain. In linear algebra, when a matrix is diagonalizable, we can write it as a sum over its eigenvalues and eigenvectors. Like in this case, where the matrix A has this spectral decomposition, with eigenvalues 2 and 3 and projector operators E onto the one-dimensional subspace, or eigenspace, spanned by the eigenvectors 1, 0, and 0, 1. Again, check out the PDF link for more details. In this way, the matrix is decomposed into simpler pieces, each acting along a specific direction given by the eigenvectors. These are the one-dimensional eigenspaces spanned by V1 and V2. But now, imagine we have an infinite dimensional space, like a Hilbert space, for example. Instead of a discrete set of eigenvalues, we have infinitely many of them. In this case, the eigenvector directions become so densely packed that they are infinitesimally close to one another. It's no longer a matter of a few distinct directions. It's actually a smooth continuum of directions filling up the entire space. If you guys want to support our mission to make advanced math intuitive, please consider becoming a member of the channel. Thank you for that. Summing over a finite number of eigendirections makes no sense anymore, because we can't list them all one by one. There are too many of them. In fact, they might even be uncountable. So we generalize by replacing the sum with the integral. By replacing the matrix A with a normal operator T acting on a Hilbert space, by replacing the discrete set of projection operators EI with infinitesimal projections DE of lambda, from a resolution identity, the discrete set of eigenvalues lambda I with a continuous spectrum lambda and sigma of T, and the finite index range I equals 1, 2, and so on up to N with the entire spectrum sigma of the operator T. E of lambda is the resolution of the identity, which tells us how the space can be continuously decomposed along spectral directions. For a previous example, when we had D as the matrix 2, 0, 0, 3, the resolution of the identity was I equals E1 plus E2. This was in the discrete case. In the continuous case, we'd write that I is the integral over sigma of T of D E of lambda. Each tiny increment DE of lambda acts like a projection onto the infinitesimal layer of the space aligned with the spectral value lambda. You can think of DE of lambda as a sort of spectral density. And when we integrate these infinitesimal contributions, each scaled by its corresponding spectral value, we get the famous spectral equation. I'm sure that from now on, you want to look at this equation the same way again. Now, if you want to learn how to understand eigenvalues and eigenvectors intuitively, check out this video on the channel. See you guys there.